Oh look, there's that Qualcomm thing I ordered two months ago that said it would ship two months ago, but really should have shipped about six months ago. It's here. And yes, that's sarcasm. This video is going to be full of it. This is the story of the Qualcomm Snapdragon Dev Kit, a compact form factor PC designed for Windows developers to take advantage of the next gen AI PC capabilities of Snapdragon. And yes, that was taken straight off their news release, launching this box in May. It said retail availability would start on June 18. We'll get to that. But immediately, media outlets were comparing the box to the Mac Mini, especially since Qualcomm's marketing was all about how the Snapdragon X would be the answer to Apple's M-series CPUs, finally bringing an efficient ARM chip to the Windows world. I won't bore you with every detail of the saga of trying to get one of these things, I have a blog post and a Twitter thread for that. And another YouTuber, Alex, also covered the wild journey trying to buy one of these things. Now, really quick, if you were launching a new computing platform that was going to revolutionize the world and you wanted developers to get their apps ported to it quickly so your launch would be full of wonderful and amazing software, would you A, lease out some below-cost hardware to as many developers as possible way before the public launch so they could test and build on your platform early and give you driver feedback? And then when the developers return your hardware, they get a store credit for the price they paid so they're happy with the purchase? Or B, launch your product without any developer support and sell developer kits months after the launch at cost without all the features you announced at launch, running a cheaper light version of the OS you're running with a label on the bottom that says you can't resell the hardware when you're done with it and it's warranty void if you touch it? I know what Apple did, and that's not what Qualcomm did. Now, I'm sympathetic to hardware development problems, I really am. But the lack of communication, the layers of reps developers still have to go through to get simple answers like, will there be a downloadable restore image, and just the lack of hardware entirely for months after accepting orders for it, all these things stack up to put me in a pretty bad mood about this box. And that was before I opened it. Once I did, there were a few things that reinforced that mood. Don't get me wrong, there are a few good things too, I'll get to those. But Qualcomm and Microsoft really botched the launch of Copilot Plus. Instead of revolutionizing how humans interacted with computers, headline features became high-level security nightmares like Recall, which was recalled and now is being rewritten to work a lot differently. And I'm not the only one saying this. Copilot PCs have been out a couple months now, and the resounding message is the hardware's great, but the software's not ready. Like, take Linus Tech Tip's bottom line after using Copilot laptops for a month. Qualcomm Snapdragon X laptops. Excellent if everything you do is in a browser, or if you already have another computer for the work that you need to do on <laughs> another computer. <laughs> hopefully someday it'll be for everyone, like this segue. And according to Digitimes Asia, sales of Copilot Plus PCs have fallen short of expectations. Couple that with Qualcomm's ongoing lawsuit with ARM, developer apathy after getting the runaround over and over, and Apple having launched the M4 chip, which soundly beats the pants off Snapdragon X Elite, it's just hard to get excited over this thing now. And seeing the things posted on the developer Discord, it definitely didn't inspire any more enthusiasm. This thing comes with Windows 11 Home. Even the Windows Dev Kit 2023 came with Pro. It just seems like they're cheaping out on something that's gotta cost, what, like five bucks for an OEM license? <laughs> I mean, does Microsoft even charge them for this? Then developers have been asking if there's any way to download a restore image in case they break their install. Developers have legitimate reasons to mess with disk partitions or even replace the boot volume. Plus, what if the SSD in here just breaks? There's no official way right now to even download Windows 11 for ARM if you want to reinstall it. Sorry for cutting in, but while I was editing this video, I saw this tweet that said Microsoft will finally have downloads available for ARM64 in the coming weeks. It sounds like Microsoft might start taking ARM seriously, but back to the rest of this video. Then, right before shipping, we found out they pulled the HDMI port. That's not a huge deal, and they do include this little HDMI to USB-C dongle in the box, but some people speculate that that HDMI port might have been the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of trying to get this thing finally shipped. But all that drama, all that mess, it might be worth it if this magical box lives up to the hype. Looking at the hardware, the front has a USB 4 Type-C port, a power button, and a little flap door that covers up a micro SD card slot, and hides something else we'll get to later. And then at the end there's a status LED. The left side has a huge air vent, and the right side is empty. On the back, you get a 19 volt power input, 2.5 gig ethernet, two USB 3.2 type A ports, two more USB 4 ports, and a headphone jack. Comparing the overall size, it's shorter but a lot larger than the N100 mini PCs I've reviewed before, and around the same internal volume as a used one liter mini PC like this Lenovo I bought a couple years back. And compared to the Windows Dev Kit 2023, it's just a hair wider and a couple centimeters deeper. And finally, if I flip it over, there are a bunch of air intakes on the bottom. 
Now, looking closely, there's also this warning. This device is not approved to resell by the FCC, which probably means they had some issues getting it tested in time for launch. Before we ignore these little don't open me up stickers, I'll also mention there's a 180 watt power supply and a USB-C to HDMI dongle included, along with a warranty card that states you cannot replace components. We'll see about that. By applying a little extra pressure, you can punch right through the screw stickers and unscrew the four Phillips screws holding the bottom plate on. The bottom is covered in metal shielding and there's EMI tape on a bunch of metal parts to ground everything, so it's obvious they were at least trying to get it past FCC certification. But moving along inside, there are four main removable components, starting with this Ethernet daughter card. It actually has a hidden pad for an HDMI port, along with a little chip that converts DisplayPort to HDMI, so I'm guessing this was about ready to launch and they pulled HDMI right at the last minute. The rest of the daughter card is this 2.5 gig Ethernet port that connects to a real Technic in the mini PCIe slot over here. Then there's a 2280 NVMe SSD, which when I removed it, I saw there's a post for mounting a smaller SSD too, like the one that was in the Microsoft Windows Dev Kit 2023 I tore down last year. It is a bit unconventional to see the post there just kind of jabbing right into the underside of the NVMe drive, but otherwise there's a solid heatsink and it has thermal pads on both sides to keep it cool. All the air gets pulled into the fan area through the heatsink fin, so that and the heatsink on the Wi-Fi card should keep the hotter components running okay. The Wi-Fi card is a Qualcomm Wi-Fi 7 and Bluetooth 5.4 chip, and has two antennas running to different parts of the plastic enclosure. There's one other weird daughter card up towards the front. It's odd for two reasons. First, it seems to maybe be a platform security device. It has a little 32-bit ARM microcontroller on it and this ITE chip. It's labeled Running ECB, and if you know anything more about it, leave a comment. But it's also interesting seeing this little SIM card slot tucked away underneath, right next to the micro SD card slot. It's not exposed to the front of the case, so maybe it's something they intended to use for remote debugging over 5G or something. Again, I'm not sure. But moving on, I took off the fan, which is taped onto a duct to get all the air moving out the side of the dev kit, and then worked on the giant copper heatsink. This heatsink has a huge copper plate, plus a separate portion with heat pipes taking heat directly off what I presume is the main Snapdragon X Elite SoC. Coupled with that 180 watt power supply, they mean serious business. Popping it off, there's a plethora of gummy thermal paste and a huge array of little power management chips. I had to work at the goo to get it all off and I stopped once I got down to the PCB for fear I might pop off a cap or two. But there it is in all its shiny glory, the Snapdragon X Elite. This is model X1E001DE and it has a 12 core Orion CPU, an Adreno GPU and a Hexagon NPU. Flanking it on the side are 32 gigabytes of LPDDR5X RAM in four chips, so eight gigs per chip. I took a peek around the inside and took some more photos to put up on my blog, so if you wanna go into a really, really deep dive, go check that out. But I wanted to boot this thing up and start testing, so I cleaned off the copper heatsink, repasted the thing with a generous amount of Noctuif thermal compound, replaced the SSD, Wi-Fi, network, and the weird running ECB card, and I closed it back up. Overall, I'd give this thing good marks for repairability, at least hardware-wise. Despite what the warranty card says, and despite the stickers on the screws, it's easy to get access to all the main components. Now, powering it on, there's really no excuse for Windows 11 Home. Like, seriously, this is a developer kit. I had to look this up because it's been like five years since I was stuck on a machine running Home. But Home doesn't support device encryption, you can't use Active Directory, you can't run remote desktop server, and you can't even use Hyper-V virtualization. Anyway, this video isn't about Windows and its boneheaded features like trying to force you to use a Microsoft account, it's about the dev kit. And immediately, I was surprised just how loud the fan on this thing is. The fan on my Mac Studio is so quiet I have to put my ear right against it to even hear it spinning at full tilt. On the dev kit, almost any activity would spin the fan up halfway and it was around 50 decibels in my room with a 32 dB noise floor. These aren't scientific measurements, but the fan on here is pretty annoying, certainly louder than I'd expect on any ARM computer. But fine, maybe they're killing Apple in performance and efficiency. If they are, then the fan noise might be justified. But they aren't. Running Geekbench 6 consumes a peak around 80 watts of power for a score of 3020 single and 16,000 multi-core. Citibench 2024 burns through 100 watts to get 1227 multi-core. Those numbers are about what you get on an M3 Pro in a MacBook, maybe a little better. Granted, the MacBook Pro is more expensive, but Apple's system only burns through 40 to 60 watts of power. I was gonna try testing an M3 Pro Mac Mini so I could have the exact same test scenario, but Apple still doesn't have one. Their desktops are still stuck on the old M2 series chips, while the iPad, of all things, has the fastest M4 chip. 
which, I should mention, blows the X Elite out of the water, at least for any common benchmarks. It's faster and more efficient, and you can get an iPad Pro for about the same price as the dev kit. Too bad it's not a real computer. But back to the dev kit. I ran into a couple other small bugs, like the LEDs on my Ethernet jack don't light up. Other devs said theirs did, so maybe it's just a bug on my unit. Also, it was working with my DVI display initially, but after a firmware update, my display wouldn't get a signal anymore. Now, I'm not going to lay all the blame on the dev kit. A lot of SBCs also don't like this display for some reason, but it annoyed me more because this was in the middle of rebooting like five or six times during Windows updates. I switched over to my little Ninja display, and it rebooted a couple more times for good measure. But with all that out of the way, the dev kit uses about 4.4 watts while sleeping, 8 watts at idle, 28 watts under single cord workloads, and 40 to 100 watts under full load. Firefox for Windows on ARM doesn't seem to support GPO acceleration on this box, but Edge did. Either way, 4K YouTube playback is no problem. And you might think playing YouTube videos is a silly test, but a lot of ARM devices can't do it yet, so at least the X Elite can, even without GPU decode. Now, my original plan for this video, and for the dev kit itself, was to get Linux running on it. But despite Lenaro working on Linux for Snapdragon for years, they don't have support for this box at launch. I did dump some device information and submitted it to the ARCH64 Laptops build repository, so hopefully that's a first step in getting support added. But right now, don't buy this thing expecting to run Linux on it. You can install Linux using the Windows subsystem for Linux, and I tested Ubuntu, but there are some limitations, like you only get access to half the RAM, and hardware pass-through isn't really a thing. So right now, the best Linux ARM workstation remains the Ampere desktops. Sure, you can run Asahi on a Mac, but with the Ampere motherboards you can do things like plug in a 4070 and do 4K gaming in Linux. It's kind of weird to say this, but in some ways that setup, even though it's not really as supported, is better for emulating Windows games than running Windows for ARM on this dev workstation. Not that it's great either way. And emulating x86 works fine, at least for simpler things, but it's certainly better to just buy an x86 machine if your Windows apps aren't ported to ARM yet. But bottom line, this box is priced okay for a consumer box. Except it's not a consumer box, and can't be resold. It's not as fast as the fastest M3 silicon, and it won't make a dent in the M4 for either performance or efficiency. It's barely keeping up with the latest generation Intel and AMD chips, and the flubbed Copilot Plus launch did it no favors. In my honest opinion though, Windows is what's really holding this thing back. It could be so much better running Linux. Windows could be okay if Microsoft really pushed to make Windows on ARM a thing. It's been like a decade now, and they keep saying it's the next big thing. It's kind of like fusion power. It's always going to be a decade away from viability. And Qualcomm, you gotta get behind Linux. Linux users would love an ARM machine that's faster than an SBC, but not as expensive as an Ampere workstation that can boot Linux natively. Everyone wants a Mac Mini killer on the Windows or Linux side, but this isn't that. Qualcomm's in a vicious cycle right now. People need the hardware to get developers to care about supporting it. Developers weren't able to get the hardware they needed to support it, and when they do buy the hardware, they don't get the support they need to develop for it. So there isn't enough native software support. So people don't buy it. It's no wonder MediaTek might be getting cold feet about launching into the Windows on ARM ecosystem. Until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.